May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. So, <clears throat> there's this very holy guy by the name of Simeon, and he's filled with the Spirit. And he's been told by the Spirit that he will live to see the coming of the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Lord's Messiah. And being a responsible fellow, Simeon is always on the lookout for this Messiah. Now we can imagine Simeon as being pretty old. We don't know how many years he's been waiting for the Christ, but from the story of Simeon in the Gospel of Luke, we think it was a very long time. Not only has he been waiting, but actively looking for Christ. It is like he's standing watch, a kind of lookout for humanity, who when he sees the Messiah has a duty that he must perform. It's similar to the way that we have been waiting for Jesus at Christmas and the second coming throughout this whole Advent season that we've just passed through, anticipating praying and worshiping and having a Christian duty as well. Not only to recognize the coming, but to tell other people about it. <clears throat> On a particular day, the Spirit moves him to go to the temple courts. And it just so happens that Mary and Joseph are coming to the temple courts too. And they have them with them their baby Jesus, but their reason for going to the temple is not the same reason that Simeon has for going there. Their reason, as the Bible tells us, <clears throat> is to do for Jesus what the custom of the law required. To do for Jesus what the custom of the law required. So what does the law require of them? According to Luke, it requires that the child be circumcised, and that on the eighth day, that Mary wait a time of purification before she comes to the courts, and two birds be offered as a sacrifice. And Mary and Joseph may also have been there in order to dedicate this child to God in a similar way that Hannah, back in the book of Samuel, dedicates Samuel to God. Now, I find it interesting that Mary and Joseph are at the temple to fulfill the law. And they are about to meet someone who's totally guided by the Spirit. It's really symbolic. Think about that. Jesus comes to the temple so that every jot and tittle of the law will be fulfilled. Then the Holy Family meets Simeon. And something totally out of the ordinary happens. And it has nothing to do with the law and everything to do with the Spirit. It is at this moment when there is a transition between the Old Covenant with the nation of Israel based on the law and with the New Covenant where we have a covenant with all of the people based on God's grace. Our reading from Luke doesn't make clear what Mary and Joseph think of this old man when they see him. But the text tells us that Simeon walks up to them and takes the baby, the Christ child, in his arms. Now this would seem a simple act, but think about it. If you were in church with a little baby, your little baby, or the Christ child, and some grizzled old fellow walks up to you and says, hey, let me hold that baby on. Would you be likely to just hand it over? Simeon must have been filled with the Spirit. He must have had a beatific look on his face. When I think of Simeon, I think of my maternal grandfather, old Joe Robinette. <clears throat> and when I was a kid, I, this is how I remember, he, was, uh, he had very thin hair on top, so thin that when the, the light came onto his silver hair, it looked like a halo around his head. And when he, when he moved back and forth, those hairs would kind of waggle back and forth. 
Can you imagine that? That's how I imagine Simeon. So Simeon takes the child and praises God and then says, Sovereign Lord, you have, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and a glory for your people, Israel. Now this statement is often called the Nunc Dimittis. Now Nunc Dimittis means now release, and nunc, meaning now, diminus meaning uh, release, is actually Latin, and it comes because uh, at the time, names were made up for these little hymns that go through the Gospel of Luke. You know, we have uh, Mary's Magnificat in the beginning, and here now we have the nunc diminus. And the names come because at the time that these names were made up, all theological language was basically Latin, and there was only one real translation of the Bible from Greek, and that was in the Latin. <clears throat> the idea that Simeon is now released means that his long waiting for the Messiah has come to an end. The long watch is complete, as is Simeon's joy and peace. And he knows now that all of the waiting was worthwhile and that the Savior of the world has come. And we know just how he feels on this Sunday after Christmas. Our waiting for the birth of our Savior is now complete. We know that Jesus Christ is born. But we also know how Simeon must have felt on that long watch as we continue to wait with the same hope and the same anticipation for the second coming of our Savior. But Simeon's joy and peace is not only for his own sake. Yes, his watch has ended. He knows the fulfillment of God's promise is not just about him. He has seen in this little baby that he holds in his arms the salvation of all people, both Gentile and those of Israel. This is a huge proclamation, is it not? In a similar way, we know that Jesus came to save us as individuals, but also came to be the Savior of the world. After all, we can read in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son. Now the parents react to this pronouncement. This Nuptimitus from Simeon, not because it is strange, not because they don't already know who Jesus is. Simeon is not telling them anything that they don't already know, but perhaps because they assumed that they were the only ones who knew that this little child was the Christ. I mean, Herod knew about it, right? But he was told by some passing strangers he didn't know who the mother and father was. He didn't know the exact person, did he? <clears throat> to have some stranger in the temple verify the message that the angel had already given them must have been astounding. And Luke tells us that they are indeed amazed. God indeed pours out blessings and surprises upon the world every day. Then Simeon blesses them. That's what the Bible says, blesses them. It doesn't say that he just blesses the Christ child. It doesn't just bless Mary. I think it's interesting that he blesses the entire holy family. I imagine him handing Jesus back to Mary and then pronouncing a blessing. And he blessed this nuclear family that would nurture this little mustard seed into the Savior of the world. And in that day and age, they needed a blessing, didn't they? Well, there would be many trials and tribulations for Jesus to come. It was a hard life in Roman-occupied Judea in any case, especially living in a small town like Nazareth, where just eking out a living could be difficult. But even before that, the Holy Family would be forced 
to flee to Egypt to avoid the megalomaniacal paranoia of King Herod, who, as I mentioned before, he had heard that there was a new king born in Judea and that he had decided to get that child, but he didn't know which one, so what did he do? He massacred the innocents. He sent his soldiers out to kill any child, any child that was under two years old. And what was the response of Joseph and Mary? They were told by an angel to go to Egypt, so they spent two years in Egypt. Later, Jesus would be rejected in his own town of Nazareth. He would spar with the Pharisees. He would be hounded by the Sadducees. And eventually, he would be tried and punished by the Roman authorities. Simeon speaks directly to Mary, saying some amazing things. First, that Jesus, this child, will be the cause of the falling and rising of many in Israel. I don't think this meant, is meant in a political sense, but rather in a spiritual sense. Those who accept Jesus will be lifted up, and those who reject him or persecute him will be cast down. Finally, he tells Mary that a sword will pierce your own soul too. We're not sure exactly what Simeon meant when he said this, but we can note that the sword does not pierce her body, it pierces her soul. John of Damascus, the theologian who wrote way back in the eighth century, said that this was a sign of the suffering that she would undergo as she saw her son crucified on the cross as a criminal. And I think we can agree that this would be a very painful experience, only relieved by the joy she would have felt three days later when she finds out that her son has risen from the dead. And here, Simeon passes out of the lives of the Holy Family. We don't read of him again in the Bible after this episode. He's given his blessing, but more importantly, I think, he's let Mary and Joseph know that they are truly not alone in the raising of this small child into the Savior of the world. Others filled with the Holy Spirit knew and understood others would offer help and advice. Now this must have been a comfort to two people who had taken on this huge responsibility. You know what it's like, well some of you know what it's like to raise a child in any case, but to have that child be the Christ, be the Messiah, they needed as much help as they could get. And there is a message for us in this story. Like Simeon, we should listen to God, allowing ourselves to be filled with the Spirit. We should allow the Spirit to guide us on our own mission in the world. That mission should be helping others, yes, but just as importantly, watching and waiting, anticipating for the coming of our Savior, the Christ, the Messiah. We had a foretaste of waiting and fulfillment during Advent and the glorious Christmas that just passed by. But there's another day to look forward to, and that is the day that Christ will come again. Please bow your heads and pray with me. Lord, make us faithful watchers like Simeon, always on the lookout for Christ. Yes, we wait for the Messiah's coming, but we also look for Christ in each other, seeing your image in every human, knowing that whatever we do for one another, we also do for you. This we pray with hope and confidence. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen.